Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Welcome to the Digital Enterprise Society webinar series. My name is Courtney McWhorter. I'll be your host for today. Before we get started with today's presentation, I'd like to give you a little bit more information about Digital Enterprise Society. Digital Enterprise Society is a new nonprofit member association organized to enable the transformation of product development, design, delivery, and maintenance throughout the digital enterprise, regardless of software tools used. We are dedicated to the transformation of the manufacturing enterprise workforce. We'd like to invite you all to join the Digital Enterprise Society. The Society was formed by a PLM World Transitional Board of Directors. As part of that transition, past PLM World members have been granted free Digital Enterprise Society membership. If you have a, if you had a login on the PLM World website or attended a PLM World event, including Siemens PLM Connections or regional user group events, your free membership is waiting. For those that are new to Digital Enterprise Society, we invite you to join using the promo code at the bottom of the screen. Once again, my name is Courtney McWhorter. I am the Marketing Communications Manager with Digital Enterprise Society. If you have any questions about accessing your membership or um, anything about Digital Enterprise Society, I'm happy to help. My email address is there on the screen for you, as well as my phone number. And without further delay, I'm going to introduce our presenter for today, Wendy Holliday. Wendy is the Executive Director of Digital Enterprise Society. Uh, we also encourage you to type any questions that you have throughout the presentation in the question box. A brief Q&A will follow the presentation. So, Wendy, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Courtney. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining me today on our speaking journey. And one of the things I'd like to start with is what I call the presenter attendee agreement. And this is something where that it's because the event that you're speaking with and the event today with the webinar is about you and not about me. So I like to, to, think, to get you all started in thinking that way. Um, if you're presenting to a large group and maybe a convention center, it's also a good time to talk about uh, maybe the emergency exits or things like that, just other housekeeping information. But for us today, since we're in a webinar, we can't really do things face to face, I would love for you to find that question box that Courtney was talking about a moment ago and tell me where are you listening in from? Uh, Courtney and I are here in Oberlin, Ohio, and we're about, I don't know, 40 minutes southwest of Cleveland, and it is a beautiful 48 degree day, which is balmy for here in Northeast Ohio. But if you could find that question box, let me know where are you listening in on? this webinar and what is your own oh, New York and cold <laughs> thank you um, Blacksburg Virginia Minneapolis Boulder Stockholm we've got people from all over so thank you for joining us today so when we talk about presentations we really want people to understand that it's a safe place to agree with things that are being said to disagree to question and, and just really get involved because we're here to actually help people learn and as Courtney mentioned, my name is Wendy Holliday. I'm the Executive Director for Digital Enterprise Society. And I like to use a screen like this on my presentations to kind of share usually where I've worked. But today, because the presentation is about speaking, I've kind of put some of the things up there of where I've presented before. I've spent a lot of time speaking at regional and national conferences and had the opportunity to be a best-in-class speaker for PCMA, which meant that I got to go around to their chapters all over the U.S. and, and do a lot of fun uh, activities. So this is a way if you're doing your presentation to kind of share what your background is with everyone. But that is so totally enough about me. I'm more interested in about you guys and what you're doing and what you're interested in, and specifically what you're interested in, uh, where you are in your speaking journey. So Courtney's going to start a poll. So if you've walked away from the screen, you got to come on back. Um, we're going to start a poll. Where are you in your speaking journey? I'm looking for, you know, do you want to increase your speaking skills to present or speak more at regional and national conferences? Do you want to maybe increase your speaking skills to successfully engage your peers or your boss at your company? Or you are totally a speaking pro and you're just here to support me or just here for the fun of it. All right, so right now you can't see the polls coming in, but we are going to post this after the webinar today, and you'll be able to see the final poll. But what I'm seeing right now is it looks like it's a little, it looks a little evenly split there, Courtney. So 48% right now to speak at regional and national. Oh, it's going up 50 there. 
as just as I said, it's evenly split. It's no longer evenly split. Uh, 50% or more to speak at regional and national events, uh, 42 or so to successfully engage peers and to boss. Um, and then 8% is you're just here for the fun of it. So thank you, those 8%. All right, we can head on to that next screen. Thank you. All right. So thanks for letting me know. That gives me an idea of where you all are um, on your speaking journey. And we're going to head to what our learning outcomes are for today. So there's really three learning outcomes we're going to talk about. And one is understanding or learning the right mix of content and peer discussion. And the second is identifying four actions that you can really utilize to be a successful speaker. And the last is to use persuasive titles to encourage attendants who want to you know, gain their interest. We're going to go to another poll um, to see what you think about that. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing who's interested in you know, which of these three objectives or three learning outcomes most interest you for today's presentation. So again, come back to your screen. Give me a little bit idea of what you're interested in hearing about, whether you want to hear the right mix of content and peer discussion, identify four actions a speaker can utilize to be successful, or using understanding using persuasive titles. Okay, so it looks like it's coming in. We've got about 57, 60% or so want that second outcome. Identify four actions a speaker can use to be successful. And when you're doing this live and in person, I'd encourage you to list out your objectives like this and ask people to engage in that. And we'll tell, talk a little bit more about that why. But uh, the first why on that, we'll talk more why later. But the first why is it helps me understand how much time I should spend on these different ones. And it looks like the second one is most interesting to people. So thank you for sharing that information. All right. So we're going to look ahead to our first outcome which is learning the right mix of content and peer discussion. So what we really need to understand is that the role of a speaker, a presenter, the person at the front of the room is really changing. Um, you know, we're really looking for you to be a facilitator of a discussion, to be a sense maker in things. It used to be that you'd expect to go to conferences and have a person on the stage just speaking at you the entire time. And if we really want people to learn, we really want people to move the needle in their organizations, we've got to involve them a little bit more. So let's talk a little bit about that. Why, why in the world would you want to involve them, right? So, so why do you want this peer discussion? Because you're thinking, they've asked me to speak. I know what I'm talking about. So I want to just talk to everybody and they should listen to me. Well, that's fine. And you're going to be able to portray knowledge I'm not portraying, I'm sorry, data and information, but you're not going to get to that wisdom and knowledge, that really application, without that peer discussion. Um, because we know that the person that does the most prep, the person that is most engaged, is the person that learns the most from the session. Uh, it's actually one of the reasons that I push myself to speak um, regionally and nationally, and I encourage staff and anybody else I know to put themselves out there, because the person that is doing the presenting is learning the most and you're helping your company and you're really getting out there. So how can you uh, you change that and not make you're the only person that's learning, but the people that are coming to your session, you want them to learn too. So that's really why you want them uh, to be engaged in your sessions because it's really not about you. This session is not about me, it's about you, it's about the attendees. Uh, so you want your attendees to learn. And what's interesting, when we take a look at about adult learning, so here for those of you that are, are uh, real research uh, people that want to know all the different backgrounds. This is the Malcolm Knowles um, theory of principles of andragogy, which is adult learning, right? So it's pedagogy, learning for children, uh, uh, andragogy, which is learning for adults. Think about when you learn something new. You know, the new version of NX. Uh, you've got to learn CATIA. You've got a team center integration to something. When you learn something new as an adult, you take that new information and you compare it to what you already know. So you think to yourself, um, oh, yeah, that, that'll absolutely work. I see how that would work. Or you might think to yourself, well, if I do this, it's going to cause this and this and this, this cascading of other issues. Um, but adults need that time. So in order for you to help people move from just listening and getting that data from you and really truly learning and applying the information uh, that you really have to give them that time, that time for discussion, that time to think about it. Because you really want to get your attendees involved. And it does help them make uh, great takeaways that, whole, that learning does increase their learning. 
Now, whether you think it's good news or not, but the good news is, is that you talk less because you are trying to get your attendees to be engaged and as they're engaged, it's not necessarily you talking the entire time. Now I say that, but we're here on a webinar, so that means I'm talking the entire time, which is not my favorite thing to do. But right now we don't have it integ integrated back and forth on the webinar platform, so um, we're gonna talk a little bit of what it would look like if you were doing it in person. So say you're gonna come up and you're going, you're, you're submitting to present at Realize Live coming up uh, this, this coming June, and you want, um, maybe it's a knowledge theater session, or maybe a 45 minute, it could be 45 minute or an hour session, 90 minute a longer session. You think about what are the learning objectives you should focus on. So for a typical 20 minute session, so it could be a knowledge theater, somebody might call it a TED talk, whatever it might be, you're really thinking about really only one, one learning objective, just the one. When you're looking at a 45 minute or so session, you're really thinking about two learning objectives, only two. And a 90 minute one, a longer series, you're getting into that three. So if we're looking at that, let's talk, let's think about what that means for your presentation. So for a typical 45 minute, maybe, maybe, maybe an hour session, and you've got those two learning objectives, you've got a little bit of time for intro and asking everybody, you know, where they're from and, and introduce yourself to your neighbor, that kind of thing. And then you're going to focus on about eight minutes of content. This is true new information you are presenting to your audience. And then you want to ask them to work in a group. We'll talk a little bit about that more in a minute. But then you kind of go back sharing from the group. Then again, the second group, your second learning objective and the eight minutes of content. And then you repeat that process and then the closing. So what that looks like is really just 16 minutes of content that you are preparing for, for a 45 minute session. And wow, doesn't that seem like a small, small amount of content? And it is. And that's kind of where we all lose, lose track or we get off base here is that we have so much content we're trying to get out there, it's too much. People cannot absorb that amount. It doesn't, like, it's not meaningful. So you have to really back down to what are the few core things in the case of a 45 minute session, is 16 minutes that you wanna get across to people. And I know, and it, it really boils down to, because discussion is more important than the actual content, the, the amount of content that you cover. So not the actual content, but the amount of content that you cover, because you want the people to come away from your session actually having learned something, um, changed something, done something better in their organization. Now, so that's as we talk about in, a, in an actual um, uh, in-person event. But we also want to talk just a minute about uh, what could you do at your company, involving your peers, maybe at a meeting that you're hosting at your, your company? Um, so here are some things that you might think about, and I'm going to go back to a poll. So everybody, come back to your computers and help me out with this poll. So if you wanted to involve your peers, so you've got to present a new change, you're in the IT area, and you're doing a new system, and you want everybody to pay attention, you know, what kind of things would help you make more, help you make more successful and get people to learn what you're saying? And here's a few options here. First is meet prior to, oh, go ahead and we're going to do the polls. We go ahead and, oh, we started the poll. Okay, sorry, thank you. <laughs> so we're going to do, how would you involve your, your peers? Meet prior to the meeting to understand the department and individual needs. Alternate between speaking and asking questions during the meeting. Ask how your presented ideas will impact and interact with the department and individual needs or all of the above. Great, the great news is 81%, 83% are saying all of the above. Oh, we're toggling between 70s and 80s. All of the above. And that's right. So you can do all of those, but actually there's no wrong answer here. Any one of those things is going to help you involve your peers and be more successful at getting your changes adopted into your organization. So thank you for playing along with that. We're going to spend a little bit more time on Outcome two, because most of you guys at the beginning said that that was more important to you was outcome two, identifying the four actions a speaker can do to be successful. And we really haven't broken them down into four areas. And one is about neuroscience, and we'll talk a little bit about some of those. I like using some of the latest research and education to help us be successful. We're going to talk about actively engaging your audience. We talked a little bit about that in the first outcome, but we're going to go more in depth talking about templates and photos and um, how to prepare. So one of my favorite uh, uh, writers is John Medina, uh, Medina, 
is I believe how you spell his pronounce his last name on brain rules. And it, he talks a lot about your neuroscience and the application of that in our daily lives, speaking and presenting. The end of this slideshow is a resource page, and it will be listed on the website as well with links to a lot of these things that we'll be talking about. Oh, actually, all the things we'll be talking about today. But some of the little pieces in neuroscience is um, you want to prep the person and their mind for your, for your activity, for your session. So if we were having in the big group, I would ask you to chain, turn to your neighbor. What I did here on the webinar is I asked you to tell me where you were calling in from, so that or where you were listening from. So that kind of gets you attuned, oh, I'm here, I'm at this webinar, I'm here to listen. If you're in person, I would say turn to your neighbor and introduce yourself because if you're at in-person meetings, you want people to network, you want people to engage. So you turn to your neighbor and introduce yourself and maybe you ask them a question. Um, so that's where I like to start. I also like, and if you notice we did it today, um, list what your objectives are for that day, for your session, and ask them which one you're most interested in hearing. So for you guys, you did a, you did a poll for me and you, you listed which one was most interesting. It does a couple things. One, it tells me where I should focus on, which for this group was objective number two you really wanted to hear. So it tells me where I could spend a little bit more time on, but it also helps you, your brain will wake up when uh, you, when that objective comes. So, for example, for those of you that listed objective two, when that came on your screen, you then kind of in the back of your mind, you might not be in the front of your mind, but in the back of your mind will say, oh, this is the one I voted for. This The information is coming that I want to hear. So those are some of the things you want to do from a neuroscience, as well as chunking. So people have short attention spans, right? And so we really want to look at how can we chunk that information, like information together in smaller groups, chunk as much as you can. So when we're taking a look at actively engaging your audience, it's the second thing in those four items. Lots of different ways you can do it. I'm going to show you a couple of them here. You don't have to only limit it to this. Um, and I think you really want to be sure to understand that you, you're not expected to be the smartest person in the room. And with this group, and with this group, it's really hard to be the smartest person in the room. I mean, uh, very learned individuals that are attending your sessions. And that's okay. You know, you want to engage and get people talking and discussing, and you don't need to worry about it. So earlier you saw this uh, layout of a 45-minute session. And I want to talk just a bit more about how this would work for you. So you do your introduction, you're welcome. That's where you say, turn to your neighbor. Um, sit in groups of two or three, uh, that kind of a thing. Turn to your neighbor, share whatever it is, something that's relevant to your session. And then you've got your first learning objectives with your eight minutes of content. And then you ask them to go back to the same people they shared with, and you ask them a question that they're going to um, discuss in their group. So basically, you want a question that's related to the content that you offered and get them to discuss it on their own. This is where you're moving from just data and information to true knowledge and understanding for those adult learners that, you know, that time to reflect. And back and forth, you're not the smartest person in the room. There might be somebody else in those sessions that have great things to say. And then you're going to have a sharing of that. And I don't mean this isn't, this isn't elementary school. You're not going to go around and ask every group to report out what they said. Not at all. Um, and plus, you might be in a very big session where you might have, you know, 500 people in front of you and it's not possible. So, while the sharing is happening, while that five to six, six minutes of group work is happening, I like to walk around, kind of listen in and hear things. So then when we get to this sharing and the output, if nobody raises their hand, I might say, oh, John over here or Katie over there, I thought your group had something good to say. Would you mind sharing that? Because that way you've already given them that acknowledgement of, hey, I thought you said something great. So of course they're going to be willing to share it. Um, and then if you've got multiple people that raise their hands, you know, just pick a couple and share. And you never know. Uh, what they're going to say. I, I'm often very pleasantly surprised at the fantastic, wonderful ideas that I hear from the groups, and you know, then I get to steal those ideas too. Because again, I'm, you know, you're not the smartest person in the room, and that's okay. Then you're going to repeat everything you just did: eight minutes of the content, five or six minutes of group work, three to four minutes of sharing of that group work back out to the larger group, and then you're done with your main content. You go back to uh, any questions from the group and a closing of your or, of your of your session. It's a little bit longer than that if you do the 90-minute, hour 90-minute session, but that's really how it breaks down. 
But it's really important to focus on two to three key takeaways um, within that five to seven minutes of group work because you want people to really, you know, what is that smart question that you've asked them so they get those key takeaways. Um, don't worry about, like I mentioned earlier, asking for volunteers to report out to the larger session. And don't worry, again, if, if they don't, if they're not willing to do that or people are hesitant. Um, you know, as you're moving around the, the room and hearing the great things, maybe you even just say it for them. Say, hey, Katie had this great thing to say or, or Katie's group said this. I thought that was really interesting. And just move on. But again, it's all key down to those strong questions. So when you create your content and your eight minutes of strong content for each objective or so, Think of what would be the question you would ask based on that content to get people really reflecting on what you just said and moving into, into that true knowledge for that. So if we're doing, if polling is a good thing to use as well. And so as far as that, you can say how many people thought this, how many people thought that. If you do it on a webinar like we've been doing, it's an actual system. Um, Sometimes when you're presenting at conferences, they'll have an actual polling that you can do. So instead of asking everybody to report back, you could say how many felt this way, how many had this, and you can do those kinds of things in a digital poll that they might have clickers or their or the conference app. Or you could do it old school, just have people raise their hands, you know, how many felt this way. So any kind of audience engagement that you can do like that is going to help you. And talk, let's talk a minute about templates and photos. So, so people that own their own conferences probably aren't going to like this comment, but if you notice that all my individual photos do not, or my slides do not have the little bug in the corner that says Digital Enterprise Society or the events or the webinar, that kind of stuff, they know where they're at. Make sure that you're using the conference template um, at the beginning and at the end, but there's no need to use it all the way through. Um, it also takes away from what you're trying to say and it, it breaks up the image. So you might, people might not like that I said that, but that, that's the information I'd encourage you to try to do. Photos is another one of them. I'm a huge fan of using photos. Um, if you can, use real photos from your company, from your experience and what you're doing, and, and, and use them up there. Of course, always use them with permission. If you've got to clear it with your legal, make sure you're doing that. If you need more photos, just some fun photos, I don't know, I like rabbits, I thought I found a rabbit photo here. Um, Flickr, if you go to flickr.com and search anything you're looking for, they'll, you'll come up with hundreds if not thousands of options. And you want to choose the commercial use allowed section to allow to use your photo legally and then you can source that and so the, you know, in the, the back of your, your presentation that information is sourced. So I encourage you to use as many photos as you can because it makes it a more interesting presentation. So we do need to prepare. But I think a lot of times what we do is we over prepare. We practice, 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 and we get out there and it's almost like a robot that's speaking. So we don't want to do that. So you're going to originally put your, your, your presentation together, your speech, whatever you're doing. Again, because you are not, we're not talking like you are the motivational speaker that's being paid a couple grand to be in front of everybody. This is an educational session. So put your piece together, get what you're going to say, make your slides up. Maybe go through it one time, a couple weeks ahead, and then maybe the day before the day of, go through it one more time. Don't over-practice. You don't want to sound like a robot as you're going through. You really want to be in the moment. Tell the story. You know, give yourself that opportunity to tell that story. And this is a good one. Um, what if you see a mistake in the slide that you're presenting? So you've taken all this time, you've reviewed your slides, and you're up here live in the audience, and you see a mistake. Don't address it. Pretend like you didn't see it at all. More likely than not, nobody is going to tell you there's a mistake on the slide. If they do, say thanks. We'll make sure, you know, we'll get that. Just acknowledge it. And if somebody says it and move on, but if nobody says anything and you see it, you see it for yourself, don't do anything. Just pretend you didn't even see it. Eye contact is really important when you're doing it, when you're presenting. I personally like to stand at the entrance and welcome people as they're coming in or go around table to table, depending on how it's set up. Um, I, you know, don't just focus on one person and do like a laser beam through them because they'll be, they'll be thinking, oh, what am I doing wrong? Why are you looking at me? Um, but instead, really take, you know, time to look at different people throughout the, the thing, the, the room. Um, if it makes you nervous, uh, you can take a look at their forehead because you're in a big room. They'll probably think you're looking behind them or the person in front of them, behind them thinks you're looking at the person in front of them. Just, but whatever you need to do to make yourself feel comfortable, make sure that you are utilizing that eye contact. 
Now, a lot of the places that you're going to present will have a speaker ready room, and I'd highly encourage you to make use of that. You know, not only will it give you a little bit of space, a little bit of downtime to collect your thoughts or, or try out the equipment, but um, it just it's another way just to get you get yourself ready for the presentation. If there's not one, or even if there is one, make sure you go to your room ahead of time. Take a look at it. Does it look like you you thought it would? Uh, you just take a look at the setup. If you're going to be moving the chairs or something, and, you know, get that in your head what you're going to be doing. Make sure you move the chairs back afterwards. But you know, just go ahead and utilize that speaker ready room. Now, our last outcome today. So this was this was this is going to be a short one because again, at the first when we first came in today, this one was not as interesting as some of the other ones. So we'll just go kind of briefly through this. But it is one way that I, I love to use this little device. Um, this website to help us create these per persuasive titles because we do want to encourage people attendance and it's the title that gets them right that people aren't going to read through everything so titles help so one of the things I love to use is called the advanced marketing Institute's headline analyzer and uh, there's the website there below and on the resource page at the end um, it has information on how to utilize this so basically you put in what you think your headline wants to be. You select a category. For in this case, it was education because we're doing an educational event. But there's even things like automotive in there and other things depending on the industry. And it's going to analyze your headline for an emotional marketing value that falls into three areas. Is it intellectual? Is it empathetic? Is it spiritual? You know, for me, I wanted an educational one. And I can tell you that the Be an Extraordinary Speaker was not the first headline I used. It was some other things. But my first headline I used, I think it was maybe got 20%. And I'd love to say that all my headlines have 100%, but no, this is probably one of maybe three in my entire life that I put in here that got 100% uh, in the EMV score. Um, but you want to mess around with your title and see what it shows. So you see, being an extraordinary speaker came back at that 100%, and it tells you that it's an intellectual, which is what I was going for. So it's a, it's a fun way, not only for your presentations, but if you're um, sending sending messages. You might even think about the emails that you send and the subject lines, what's getting through to your boss or to your coworkers. It's a fun little thing to to use to give it a try. So um, we're going to go back. So if you've stepped away from your computer, come on back. We're going to do another poll. So I'm going to ask you. You know, we've, we've listened to the, we've listed a number of things today, and so I would like to see you know what you're going or willing to commit to for the next time you speak. So Courtney is opening the, the poll right now. Thank you very much, Courtney. And uh, so there's a few things I want to ask. You can click all that apply. Will you commit to asking great questions during your next interview, to involving engaging peers and attendees, to using photos, images, and or charts, to creating clear outcomes or goals for your session and meeting, making sure you have those at the out start, um, chunking your content. You know, people have short attention spans and it helps them uh, learn going forward. All right, so the results are coming in from the poll. I'm going to read each one of these as they come through. Give it another moment. I like it. So 67% are going to commit to asking great questions, 73% involving and engaging peers, 65% using photos. Yeah, it's still the lower one. People don't like the photos. 74% <laughs> creating clear outcomes or goals for the session, and 63% chunking. Content. So I appreciate that you're willing, it looks like over half at least, are willing to try these, which I greatly appreciate. So uh, we, we threw a lot at you in a, in a half hour time or so, and I want to see if there's any questions that you might have uh, from what we had today. So go back to that uh, question box, and if you've got any questions coming in, let's see. I've got a question coming in. For engineering conference presentations, it is best to avoid including equations in the presentation slides. Is it, oh, is it best to avoid including equations in the presentation slides? I've heard that showing equations may lose the audience. Well, I think it depends on your audience. Uh, you know, if you've got uh, an engineering conference and they really need to see those equations because it's, it ties directly to your content and it makes sense, maybe they need that equation to under, better understand your content. If it's, you know, something that's, extra and not needed in your presentation, it was just an extra piece, maybe you use it in some research documents that, hey, if you'd like to see the equations of how we got here, here's a link to those. So hopefully that, 
that help. Okay. Um, another question about resource. Where is a resource for photos again? Uh, Flickr.com is, is a great uh, a resource for photos. Just make sure you're using commercial use allowed. Um, comment from Ryan. Think about this 16 minutes at 150 words per minute is 2,400 words. <laughs> yes. Um, Oh, can you say something for the to the folks that who use eye charts in their presentations? Thank you, Dennis, for reminding me. Yes. So, if you notice on the slides we had today, there's very little words on the slides. The only slides that had a lot of words were the um, the slide on the headline analyzer because I wanted to give you an idea of what the website looked like when you clicked on it. It it, it doesn't further your cause. You really want to have that opportunity to have. Uh, to, to narrow down your focus of what you're saying into to lesser words. And I know the the comment from uh, Mark Twain, you know, what was that? If I, I'd, I would have written less if I'd had more time. It is harder to distill your information into less. But again, with chunking and with the, the attention spans that are out there, you've got to do that. You've got to use images and you've got to use less words. All right, so... Adam has, how do you balance using images and illustrations versus white space to avoid your slides looking like a big mess? Um, well, one of the things I like to use is, you know, understand what you have. So on the question slide I have here, I could have written questions across the bottom of it to actually say that we're having questions, but kind of image kind of says it all. Um, and so it's just a matter of, of utilizing that. You can also utilize having some grayed out uh, background, like a, a semi-transparent background with your with your words on top of that to kind of put the image, but um, to, to keep the image behind and your words to come forward. Um, so those are a couple areas that you can do to keep that. Um, <laughs> I like the comment, <laughs> right? Correct, bullets are for weapons, not slide decks. I like that. Um, so, and I think there's a good comment to come in through. You do want people to listen and engage. So not just listen to the presenter, but engage with each other. Uh, it, it's really meant to have a back and forth to, to really for that instructional design really should be a back and forth. Um, I had a question earlier about room setups. So if you have your, if you have your, you can do anything. Um, with your room. I'd recommend doing rounds or half rounds because it allows people a little bit better to, a little bit easier to connect, engage, and have those discussions with each other. So if you can do a half round or a round, fantastic. It sets people in smaller groups. But if, if you can't do that and you're in a lecture hall where the seats are, are um, stationary and you can't move things around, just ask people to turn to their neighbor when you have those types of things. All right, any last questions? Let me make sure that I got everybody here. Okay, so we're good with that. All right, so I'm going to go to the last slide. It's also the last thing I want to talk to you about. Um, so I want you to leave with, um, one second, please. What are your, one more question came through. What's your recommendation for handling participants that ask way too many questions? Oh, that's a good one. All right, so before we get to the wrap-up slide, we're still going to go back to our questions. So we're back on this, we're back on this slide. All right, so great question. What are your recommendations for handling participants that ask too many questions? So I would try to move around and give everybody a chance. You know, if you've already gone to that person, just move on to another one. If they're starting to monopolize your time, you can say, that is great. I want to take this, this discussion with you offline, and we're going to get to the rest of, um, to get to the rest of this session to be cognizant of everybody's time. That's a great one. Now, if you notice in this one, I asked for questions before we did the closing. So we're going to go to the closing, uh, one of the wrap-up slides. Um, I got a couple wrap-up slides, this one and resources. And this is important. I want you to not do questions as your final slide because if nobody has any questions, and that could be for perfectly valid reasons. They didn't have any questions because you were so good you got all the answers. They didn't have any questions because you're still thinking about what you had to say and they couldn't reflect on it fast enough. Um, if you have questions as your last slide, it kind of like oh, rings everybody down as a, as, a, as a bummer for the end because nobody had any questions and then it just ends that way. So we don't want to end that way. 
Um, so instead, let's take a look, you know, so have your questions and then go to a wrap up slide, maybe some resource slides and things like that. So for us, we're going to wrap up by just kind of reminding you that people learn, they truly learn when you involve them. So think of ways that how you can learn your peers at your company, how can you involve them in the learning at your sessions that you present, that you want to facilitate and ask great questions. So you want to provide that little bit of content facilitate those discussions and have those great questions. And my personal mantra is people support what they help to create. Anytime you can involve your peers, and I'm not saying you're, that gives you license to let them do your job, not at all, but you're letting people as a sneak peek into what you're doing uh, to get that done. All right, Courtney's pointing out one more thing. What's the question here? What is the makeup of a great question? So Ryan, Ryan has got good questions here. That, that's a good question, right? So one of the questions you want to do is it should relate back to what you're saying and it should be something that will cause them to reflect on what your uh, presented material was and reflect on that in their current situation. So you want to use the content that you've been presenting and rephrase it in a question and how it relates to them. So based on this, when, when I said this, how does that impact what you're doing? How would this change this? Would it change your processes? Would it change your people? You know, those kinds of things. So reflect back on what you were doing. All right, so the last slide that we have here is our resource page. And again, this is going to be available on the website after the presentation. These are just a few of the things that, that I like. Um, I'm a big fan of Harvard Business Review, so there's a few uh, recent articles. Actually, one came out yesterday. Um, and it has some more tactical information about uh, public speaking. There's a few other things too, like John uh, Medina's, his brain rules, and um, the board savvy CEO, which has a lot about uh, working with peers and things like that, and as well as strategic doing with Scott Hutchison and, and the other authors, and we're actually going to have a course coming up in the second, third, and fourth uh, um, quarters of this year on strategic doing. But I really appreciate all of your time today, and if you want to hear this again, you can um, see it online. I hope that you guys will reach out and connect with me. Uh, let me know what worked for you. If you've got other questions, that little uh, chart there is a scan if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, it's an easy way to connect, or you can have my phone number and email is there. So I thanks, everyone, and have a great day. Thank you so much, Wendy. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. As Wendy mentioned, a recording of the presentation will be available on our website shortly. I also invite you all to listen to the Digital Enterprise Society podcast. We have uh, great new episodes are released every Wednesday, and you can find them on your uh, favorite podcast streaming platforms. You can also find us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Uh, I encourage you to follow us there as, as well as on the website. Um, any new webinars and new opportunities that we have coming up, we do have some exciting things happening in 2020, so we um, invite you to follow us along there and be the first to know um, some of those things as well. Once again, my name is Courtney McWhorter. I am the Marketing Communications Manager with Digital Enterprise Society. If you have any questions at all um, about how to access your membership or any of your member benefits, please feel free to contact me. I am happy to help. And visit us at digitalenterprisesociety.org. We look forward to hearing from you and seeing it on our next webinar. Thank you all and have a wonderful day.